Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Valley and Human Rights Watch, a warm welcome to the seventh edition of the Human Rights Weekend. My name is Katrien van der Linden, and I'm the Netherlands Director of Human Rights Watch. We are very proud of the program that we have in store for you this year, including film premieres and fascinating discussions. This year's theme is, where do I stand? We encourage you to think about your position and the difference you can make when it comes to understanding and promoting human rights. This weekend would not have been possible without the support of our partners, as shown on the screen behind me, as well as those who support this event anonymously. A special thank you to Juri Albrecht and his team here at the Bali for collaborating with us once again. I would also like to highlight our appreciation for the ongoing un uh, valuable support of the Dutch Postcode Lottery and Adesium Foundation. And finally, I would like to thank our incredible Netherlands Committee, in particular the Outreach and Advocacy Committee and our staff members, Josine Marije, Caroline and Lisa. Thank you for your enthusiasm and commitment. We are honored that our Minister for Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation Sigrid Kaag will officially open this evening, followed by Human Rights Watch Executive Director Kenneth Roth. After the opening remarks, we will watch the Dutch premiere of the incredible Prosecuting Evil, the extraordinary world of Ben Ferenc. A short Q&A with filmmaker Barry Average and Belkis Jera from our International Justice Programme will follow. I wish you a great evening, and I will now give the floor to our minister, Sigrid Kaag. Thank you. Evening. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here, Kenneth, Kenneth Roth, Human Rights Watch. And the theme of the film, of course, or rather of the evening, of the week, Where Do I Stand, I think is very applicable to all of us. Where do I stand? Where do we stand? When it comes to human rights, it is no understatement to conclude that this question is more relevant today than it has been for a very long time. Sometimes it takes a very bad fall to know where you stand. And a bad fall, to my mind, is what's taking place. As much as I wish this wasn't the case, human rights are under siege. I see th three trends that are particularly concerning. The crumbling consensus on human rights. The nexus between technology and human rights, or the absence and shrinking space, and the narrowing down of the very concept of democracy. And if you permit me, I'd like to raise these three points and briefly discuss them with you. First of all, the consensus on the universality of human rights is crumbling. After the Berlin Wall came down, the trend was unmistakably in favor of human rights, rule of law, and democracy the way we understood it. Between 1987 and 2007, the number of countries classified as free, between inverted commas, by Freedom House shot up. The opposite was true for countries classified not free, between inverted commas. In the past 10 years, as many of you know, unfortunately, the number of considered free countries has gone down again. And we all know the reports. The Civicus, for instance, is sounding the alarm bell about the shrinking space for civil society. And I quote, growing surveillance and manipulation of opinion and increasing threats to journalism. But it is a series of conclusions. And this week, Freedom House reports that democracy is in retreat around the world, with 2019 marking the 13th consecutive year of decline in global freedom. And of course, Human Rights Watch, with its reporting standings at the forefront of exposing abuses worldwide, be it abuse in the garment sector, be it abuse of migrants, abuse of refugees, lack of access, no asylum, LGBTI youth, it is endless. And the trend is unmistakably negative. For a long time, however, the consensus remained that upholding human rights was the way to go, to go for countries to get ahead in the world. At the very least, governments wanted to be seen to be upholding human rights. And those lagging behind would go at great length or a considerable length to explain why and would want to appear to strive to do better. In short, the norm itself and its universality were not contested. But this is no longer the case. 
Authoritarian governments are no longer making excuses, are no longer striving to do better, or trying to be seen to do better. Rather, they are upholding their own models as so-called preferred alternatives. The narrative that human rights should take a back seat to economic development has been around for some time. According to this storyline, governments can hit a sort of pause button on human rights until their country's economic development is on track. So the saying goes. In recent years, due to their economic growth, these countries have gained confidence in this approach. And of course, we recognize that economic development is an important driver to allow people to improve and enhance their well-being. But it cannot be separated ever from human rights or the human rights agenda. Nor can it be a justification for the denial of people of their civil and political rights, nor for that matter, their economic, social or cultural rights. There is no pause button for human rights, not for the sake of the economy, not for the sake of security. Development as well is a human right. Freedom spurs inclusive development and is fairly simple. And it's no coincidence, of course, that the Sustainable Development Goals pledge to leave no one behind. All too often, economic growth still benefits the ones in power at the expense of the bottom poor and most vulnerable groups in society. How else can we explain that after years of relatively sound economic growth in many countries in the Middle East, North Africa region, the Arab uprising was embraced by so many and so quickly in 2010. People from across the specter of the very societies rose up to claim their political rights. And this brings me to the second trend that concerns me, the nexus between technology and human rights. You will all recall that the Arab uprising owed a lot to technology, in particular the so use of social media. And technology, as we all know, can be a wonderful source of emancipation, exposure, access to new information, and in particularly knowledge, but also documentation. It can definitely be a force for good. It can offer practical solutions in very difficult humanitarian circumstances. And blockchain technology has already proven to be of great help and relevance in refugee settings. But with all the progress and all our combined efforts to introduce innovation, it also comes with risks and it raises difficult questions, also and in particular in the field of human rights. Some authoritarian regimes are using the power of technology for their own internal domestic purposes. The result can be draconian systems of censorship, enhanced monitoring, and tracking up dissidents and human rights defenders. The net has closed so tightly around people with dissenting views that they don't dare to express them anymore and do not know where to go, let alone stand up for their rights or the rights of others. To paraphrase George Orwell, whom I think we think of a lot nowadays, in 1984, nothing is their own except the few cubic centimeters inside their skulls. Orwell wrote a dystopian novel, fiction, Today, however, we are talking about an emerging new reality, a reality that risks spreading, because this type of technology, or rather the use of the technology, is being exported to a wide range of states. Ladies and gentlemen, three years after the end of the Second World War, at the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Chairwoman Eleanor Roosevelt expressed the hope that this text would become the International Magna Carta of all men and women everywhere. The concept of everywhere in the meantime has dramatically changed and Ms. Roosevelt would not have guessed that the scope of her Magna Carta would have been extended to this new elusive dimension, cyberspace. I'm the first to recognize and I think we can all agree that in the past decades we have witnessed the tremendous force for good that our interconnectedness provides. It has alerted us, it has enlightened us, it has also alarmed us. The internet opens grand possibilities to democratize knowledge, freedom of expression, political participation, and education. And sometimes cyberspace can even be the last safe space where basic rights can be discussed and promoted in a community of practice. We've seen telling examples of this, of this in the past. But internet can only be the force for good if, firstly, the internet is open, open, free and available for all. And secondly, if using the possibilities of internet, its use can be made safe and secure, 
without associated risks. There's a global connectivity gap, of course, worldwide. 60% of the world population still has no access or regular access to the internet. Partly, this also is explained by an enhanced gender gap. On the second point, freedom online is under threat. So tells us also the recent, most recent Freedom House report. An increasing number of governments is censoring information. Worldwide, the number of arrests for online sharing of information, on politics, one's views, religion, or any aspect of society is on the increase. In the last years, 14 countries alone passed new legislation to improve their very own surveillance of their own citizens. What's more, more and more countries shut down the internet to stifle dissent. This means the space for human rights defenders shrinks and risks shrinking even further, not only offline, but online, in cyberspace. The Netherlands tries to actively address this aspect on various international chessboards, so to speak. We raise the issue in Freedom Online, in this, the coalition, but also in the Global Conference on Cyberspace, which made Freedom Online one of its central themes. Internationally, we also try to rally forces and align ourselves in our support to various tangible projects through the Digital Defenders Partnership, which helps human rights defenders who are in need of practical digital assistance. Cyberspace and human rights is a whole new arena of possibility but also risks, and we have to address it, and we do so actively. And I was pleased to see, of course, no surprises, it's also a central theme in your program this week. Now, the last and third worrisome trend I want to highlight, out of a selection of trends, uh, is the following. In some corners of the world, the concept of democracy also appears to have been further narrowed down to the mechanics of electoral processes, the way in which societies choose their representatives, but this is only a small part, as we know, of the profound, expansive story that happens to be democracy. A mature democracy needs so much more. Inbuilt checks and balances, separation of powers, strong institutions, rule of law, access to justice for all, as we've just hosted the conference this morning, it's high on my agenda, and amongst others, independent courts that are truly accessible and render justice to all in a transparent and fair manner. The realization that nobody should be above the law, not even governments, and actually particularly not governments. This is something keenly understood by Ben Ferenc, the subject of the film I know we are about to see, who fought his entire life for his motto, law, not war. But in Europe, we know from our own experience that building mature democracies can take time and effort. And it's a work never done. On the ash heaps of World War II, decades of fine-tuning, adjustment, realignment of law and institutions have followed, so that indeed no one is left behind. But a mature rule of law entity, a state, takes decades to build, to nurture, and is surprisingly easy to break down. We see attempts emerging that want to do just that, even within our own European borders. These attempts to replace our project with an alternative storyline of illiberalism, inverted commas, to hide behind the so often cited will of the people, to demonize others and to lure voters with simplistic slogan solutions that some individuals or groups like to offer. This should also be addressed. Why? Because with checks and balances, majority rule, without checks and balances, beg your pardon, Majority rule risks becoming a tyranny of the majority. To avoid that from ever happening again, we need respect, ultimate respect for the rule of law, for human rights and the institutions that represent these and the defenders that speak for them. And they are enshrined in our European treaties. These are values that are hard fought. Rights that are a prerequisite to so much else, stability, social cohesion and inclusive economic growth even covering trade and investments, yeah, those as well. Human rights, and it sounds almost basic, are in all of our interest, yours, mine, and everybody. But we have to realize the rights of someone else are also in my shared interest. It is about our shared values. So from my perspective, we have to continue to defend, to reform, 
and to protect the very system of human rights that has been established. To avoid, as Kagan recently put in his book, that the jungle grows back. In closing, I'm convinced here in Europe, we owe just as much to our ability to respect human rights as we do to our economic growth and to the understanding that human rights require constant cultivation, maintenance, courage, and vision. We do so in the Netherlands, and our work he even here is not done on issues like equal pay for men and women, or on issues such as discrimination on the labor market. And internationally, we will continue to stand behind human rights defenders and to advance the promotion of the human rights agenda, particularly for the safety of journalists, or the freedom of expression, freedom of religion or belief, including the, the possibility to not believe, and equal rights for, for the LGBTI. We will continue to promote these and all universal rights so that human rights defenders, with the support and strong advocacy of organizations such as Human Rights Watch, can continue to do their invaluable work so that governments or individuals seeking to suppress human rights under the guise of a new development model will in the end not be able to achieve their goal. But we cannot do it alone. Popular support, or rather support, widely, uh, widely carried for human rights and the rule of law remains essential. And this is why meetings and efforts and the engagement of Human Rights Watch, even a week, or is it a day or a week? A weekend, okay, sorry, but well, it should have been a week maybe. A weekend such as this, next time, is so valuable and so important. It's a clarion call, it's a wake-up call, but it's also a force for good and encouragement. And I'm glad to have been here tonight and I'm deeply honored you asked me to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that clarion call you just, you just made, Your Excellency, Minister Sigrid Kaag, for opening the Human Rights Weekend. It is, we expanded it by one day, it's almost a week now. So um, uh, that's an experiment. Um, it's one more day, actually. So maybe next year it's a week. Um, and then you have been the prophet of that. Um, thank you very much for, for opening this. Uh, my name is Juri Albrecht. I'm director of the Bali, and I'm very, very happy that you're all here. Um, this is the seventh consecutive year we're doing this together with Human Rights Watch, and it's a great, great pleasure to do this every year. Um, we, um, we are very thankful, of course, to our generous support, supporters, um, our circle of friends uh, from Het Vrije Woord and Het Collectief. This wouldn't be possible for the Bali without those individuals who support us. Um, and, of course, I'd like to thank Josine Schreinemakers and Sophie Rutenfrans, editor of the Bali, who have been working on this for weeks on end, for months on end, to put together a program which is lasting till Sunday. So please come back. There's many, many more things to see and to hear. Um, and uh, we will try to not have the jungle growing back, as Kagan says it, and probably the law of the jungle, which is involved in the jungle. The law of the jungle you can read with Rudyard Kipling, and it's probably a Darwinian law, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, indeed, the rule of law is, uh, is very, very important, and who can be speaking better on that than, uh, Sir Kenneth, than Kenneth Roth, Executive Director of Human Rights Watch, um, a very good read to follow on Twitter. I do that uh, almost every day. It's amazing how he keeps you updated on everything on Human Rights Watch happening, uh, on human rights happening in the world, world. One of the foremost activists in human rights globally, I would say. It's a great honor to have you here and not have you see on, seeing, read you on Twitter, but be able to listen to you here tonight. A warm welcome to Kenneth Roth. Thank you, Yuri. I was going to try to do this in 140 characters at a time, but I'll, um, <laughs> now that they've expanded it to 280, I can you know, go on. Um, anyway, I just want to say it's, it's a total pleasure to be back in the Bali, in this, with this wonderful institution, and to be able to share you know, our, our weekend, extended weekend, once a year, is just one of the highlights of, of um, the year for all of us. So, so thank you for hosting us yet again, and it, it's, it's lovely to be here. Um, Minister, thank you very much for, for joining us. And, um, you know, I have to say, when, when you read the headlines, it, it, this is a tough time for human rights. And I think you, you, you just outlined that. Um, and, you know, part of it is the rise of autocrats around the world. And we, you know, the latest 
arrival is, is Bolsonaro of Brazil. But, you know, here in Europe, we've got, you know, Orban in, in, in Hungary, Kaczynski in Poland, Salvini in, in Italy. Look a little bit further, and there's, you know, Erdogan in Turkey or Sisi in Egypt. A little further, you get Duterte in, in the Philippines. You know, of course, there's, there's Putin, there's Trump, you know. Um, and, and, you know, what all of these have in common, and I think, Minister, you, you referred to this, is, you know, they all start off gaining power by demonizing some unpopular minority. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's not that hard to get a majority of people to hate someone. And they are very good at exploiting that. So they gain power with this anti-rights message. And then they all read from the same playbook. It's, you know, Autocracy 101. And it says, you know, once you're in power, you start chipping away at the checks and balances on executive power. So you attack the judges, which, you know, the subject tonight. You attack the journalists. You attack the activists in civil society. And, and suddenly what you're left with is, you know, just the elections, as you noted, but not the richness of debate that is what democracy is really about, and not the rule of law that holds even government officials to account and which we need in order to protect rights. And so, you know, we see this playing out over and over around the world. And then to make matters worse, there's a kind of leadership void that has emerged because so many of these autocrats are so busy embracing each other that they you know, no longer have any time or credibility to promote human rights. So you get governments acting out big time. You, know, you get Assad um, bombing civilians in, in opposition-held areas. You get the Saudi-led coalition you know, bombing and starving Yemeni civilians. You get Myanmar ethnically cleansing 700,000 Rohingya Muslims. So that's the bad news, and, and you know, it can be depressing if you only read the headlines. I'm not gonna stop there, though, because there's another story which I think is getting too little attention, and that is that these events, these developments that indeed outrage us all are also spawning a resistance. And that resistance is increasingly powerful, and what we're seeing is it's winning battles after battles. You know, there's a war, I can't say the war is over with, but there are battles that are being won. And you see this, you know, battle playing out sometimes in the streets. If you look at the big demonstrations in, you know, in Warsaw against the government's attacks on the independence of the judiciary. You see them in Budapest with, you know, Orban's illiberal democracy and, and trying to push back against that. Um, sometimes it's in the ballot box where people voted out the corrupt autocrat in Malaysia, in Armenia, in the Maldives in the U.S. midterm elections. You, know, you see it with um, you know, Ethiopia, where popular pressure produced this very impressive reformist prime minister. Um, the part that is maybe most surprising is that at the multilateral level, you know, despite Trump essentially bringing the U.S. out of the game in terms of human rights promotion, you know, despite Britain being utterly preoccupied by Brexit and having no more bandwidth, you know, despite Macron, talking a good game but not doing all that much. Um, we keep seeing interesting groups of governments banding together and pushing things forward. And so, you know, in Europe, we have the European Union twice in the last year beginning sanctions process. It's Article 7 of the EU treaty, you know, against Poland for undermining the independence of the judiciary and against Hungary for undermining democracy. You know, we see it in Latin America, where historically, Latin American democracies would never promote human rights in each other's countries because that was doing the imperialist dirty work of Washington. Um, but suddenly, when you got, you can't rely on Washington to do anything, they have risen to the occasion. And under the banner of the so-called Lima Group, you have a dozen Latin American democracies pushing Venezuela for the disaster under President Maduro. And, and getting Venezuela condemned for the first time ever at the Human Rights Council, sending Venezuela to the International Criminal Court, imposing sanctions, this is all unprecedented. Um, and it's happening really in some ways because the U.S. has left the scene. Um, you know, when it comes to chemical weapons, Russia stopped a U.N. investigation that had been authorized for the first time by the Security Council to identify who actually is using chemical weapons in Syria. They just used their veto and got rid of the investigation because they didn't like the answers. So a group of governments convinced the member states 
of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, the OPCW, based here in the Netherlands, um, to suddenly for the first time say not simply whether chemical weapons were used, that's what they usually did, but who used them? You know, Russia hates this, but it's a big step forward. And probably, you know, the multilateral effort that saved the most lives over the last year occurred with respect to Idlib province in northwestern Syria, where three million civilians were about to face indiscriminate bombardment by Russian and Syrian forces. And pressure from a series of European governments, particularly Germany, on Putin got Putin to agree to a ceasefire in September that is held to this day, with many, many lives at stake. So these are just examples of the kind of pushback that is going on. You know, people don't focus on it, it doesn't get as many headlines, but it's happening and it's very important to keep our, our eyes on that. Now, tonight we're here to celebrate Benjamin Franz and his quest for justice. I think you know he's the last surviving Nuremberg prosecutor. He was at the tender age of 27 at this historic um, occasion. He um, was really a pioneer in the field of international justice. He was there at effectively the beginning and he is a lifelong, vigorous advocate to this day at age 99, I think is what it is. He's a remarkable individual. And he recognizes the importance of justice really not only as a matter of giving basic respect to the victims, but also as a matter of preventing tomorrow's victims, of deterring tomorrow's would-be commissioner of atrocities. Now, I recognize that in some ways these are tough times for international justice. A lot of us had our hopes set on the International Criminal Court, but it's gone you know, much more slowly than we had hoped. It's had some losses. It hasn't had the budgetary or the political support that it has needed to really succeed. But there is sometimes a tendency to treat the International Criminal Court as the equivalent of international justice, and it's important to remember that there are other things going on. And I want to just highlight three of them. One was led by the Netherlands. The Saudi-led coalition was committing war crimes basically left and right in Yemen. And one thing we wanted was a UN investigation to begin documenting this. Needless to say, nobody investigates the Saudis because they're rich and they retaliate economically against anybody who dares suggest this. Well, we looked around to see who might lead this effort and very few stepped forward, the Netherlands did. And despite written threats of economic retaliation, the Dutch government pushed through now twice successfully um, a UN investigation of war crimes in Yemen, which is to this day looking over the shoulder of the Saudi crown prince. And I think combined with sort of other pressure, the, the Argentine prosecution, the outrage at the Khashoggi murder, has helped contribute to the ceasefire that has now been declared for Hodeida port in northwestern Yemen which is really the key to breaking the horrible famine that puts millions of Yemeni civilians at risk today. So that's one example of, of justice moving forward. You know, another had to do with Syria, where Russia and sometimes China kept vetoing efforts to get to the International Criminal Court, even though you know, Syria is at the top of the list of governments that should be before the court. And so um, we decided to go to the UN General Assembly, where there is no veto, and ask it to start a prosecutorial process, to begin collecting the evidence, identifying the perpetrators, making cases you know, ready for prosecution. Now, people looked at us and said, you know, you can't do this. This has never happened before. You're just making this up, which is actually true. Um, but you know, nonetheless, you know, governments joined on, and this effort ended up winning 105 to 15 in the General Assembly. And so today, there is something called the Triple IM, the International Impartial Investigative Mechanism, which is basically the Syrian prosecutor. She's a, a former French prosecutor, now based in Geneva, doing all this, getting cases ready for prosecution for when a tribunal becomes available, and there are various options to get that tribunal. We did something similar with respect to the Rohingya. Again, going to the International Criminal Court was going to be very hard because China and possibly Russia were threatening a veto. So in this case, it was the UN Human Rights Council, again, no veto, which voted on a joint effort by the European Union and very unusually, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the 57 Muslim majority nations that joined together and said, we cannot let this occur without consequences. We need to start an investigative process 
And so out of that came what's known as the ongoing investigative mechanism that is doing something very similar to what happened in Syria. So you know, what does this add up to? The lesson in my mind is that there is no guarantee of impunity. You know, yes, the powerful have their vetoes, they have their economic threats, they have ways to retaliate, but there are ways to work around that. And the world is figuring that out. The world is finding novel ways to keep the pressure on and to ensure that, you know, whether you're Assad or Kim Jong-un or Mohammed bin Salman, your day will come. There will come a time when you will be in court and where justice will be possible despite the obstacles in our way. It's never easy, but we're making very important progress. And so with that in mind, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce the film that we're about to see. My thanks to, to Barry for, for having directed this wonderful film. And, and foremost, my thanks to the star of the film for the life that he has led.